Well, I want to start with what you said today about uh, the e Economic Club of New York. You haven't made up your mind yet about 50 versus 75, whereas a lot of economists and market participants are sure that the strong labor market not cooling down means 75. You also said that you can't let inflation remain so high you need to break, bring it down quickly. So why would you even doubt the 75 basis point move? They, that seems inconsistent. Yeah. No, I just want to make sure that we have all the data before I go into that meeting and hear what my colleagues are saying around the table. I think the real issue is we need to do more. Um, we have not seen inflation move back down. Um, and we need to see that because leaving inflation where it is, if it continues, there's a higher chance that it does become embedded in the economy and affecting pricing decisions um, of, of firms and also getting into the psyche of households. And that has long-term negative connotations for the economy. So again, this is a question of, we know that it's time to continue on and persevere in bringing the, the funds rate up. Uh, we know that we're going to have to keep it there for a time t until we see inflation beginning to come back down because we really want to make sure it's on a sustainable downward path to 2%. So if you remember the dot plot right. or in the median path from the last SEP in September, we're very much aligned right. in terms of where we think policy needs to get to. Okay. Well, in fact, uh, after 300 basis points of rate hikes, um, you know, are, it, it seems that uh, the terminal rate, I want to ask you, does it look like maybe it's going to end up having to be higher than you thought? Uh, do you have any confidence now in even knowing what the terminal rate's going to be? People, many people have talked about something as high as 5%. Well, we have to wait until we see how the economy evolves. This is the assessment process that we're going to be going it through, you know, the end of this year and into next year is we want to basically get inflation on this downward path, right? Labor markets continue to be very strong. We have seen some moderation there. We have seen some moderation on, you know, on the product side of the economy, and it really is now we're going to calibrate going forward. But right now, the funds rate is just approaching a neutral a funds rate and we really need to get it above neutral for a time if we want to put inflation on the downward path and we do so again we're you know we put out the dot plots which give our best right. you know estimate at the moment of what's appropriate policy but we're going to be doing this assessment of how fast is demand moderating how mm -hmm. quickly is you know supply maybe picking up and our price pressure is coming down and that'll be the job as we go forward in this challenging time well you know the message from the fed seems to be all the comments lately that the idea is to move quickly, you know, front load the rate hikes, uh, you know, get to four and a half to four and three quarters, and then see how that's affecting inflation. But uh, to clarify, does this mean that once you get to that point, when you think you're at neutral, when it's four and a half to four and three quarters, that you're going to pause even with the funds rate well below the rate of inflation, because that's where it's likely going to be. Right. Well, I think we're going to see inflation come down next year. So when I'm thinking about, you know, how far above a neutral rate do we have to go? And I do think we're going to have to be in restricted territory, right? Remember, as inflation comes down, right, we're becoming more restrictive. So again, this is a, the assessment we have to do. So the I think the appropriate path is we continue to raise rates a bit more so we get it up to that level where we're positive in terms of the real funds rate um, based on expected inflation over the next year then we wait and assess data coming in but not only the backward looking data right and right. the lag data but also the information we're sure. getting from the street in terms of main street right real consumers real households real businesses right. telling us how they're thinking about the economy what about there's a big difference right now between the pce which is your main target and the cpi uh, i think it was it used to be about 40 basis points it's something like 200 basis points now so can you continue to target target the PCE and ignore the CPI given how different they are, especially when you're trying to figure out, you know, where, when, when you've gotten to a, not a negative funds rate, but a positive funds rate. Well, we look at a, a lot of different measures of inflation. Our target 
right? Our inflation target is formulated in terms of the headline PC inflation. So including all components, we want that to be 2%. That's our target. But when we're assessing where inflation is going, we look at the CPI. We look at the underlying measures in terms of, you know, the median um, mm -hmm. C CPI inflation, the trim mean CPI, trim mean PCE. Right. And those give us the core measures. They give us an idea of where inflation is going. So the gap is really reflective of just the okay. weights of the components and the indices, but they're all telling us right now that inflation is high and it's likely to remain high for some time. And the funds rate is still negative, so you haven't reached. So do, again, do you have to get the funds rate into at least uh, neutral, if not positive territory before you can say we can stop now and look around and see what the impact is on the economy? Yeah. My evaluation of what's appropriate policy given where the economy is and where it's going is we're going to need to have positive real funds rate which means we have to go keep going a little bit until we get to that point at that point you're right then we assess conditions and it'll really be dependent on how those price pressures that we're seeing now abate and how quickly they abate and then that's going to guide our policy going forward so we're still in the mode where we have to bring rates up we've just we're a tad still accommodative depending on how you write down uh -huh. that estimate right we haven't gone into that restrictive, restrictive territory right. and we're going to need to do that okay another topic was no, not surprisingly raised at the economic club of new york today was uh, this question of illiquid markets and uh, you said you see no evidence right now of disorderly market functioning even though a lot of market participants are saying they do they see worrisome illiquidity so I know you don't see some now, but if this worsens, if it looks like illiquidity is starting to grow, would you consider slowing down the balance sheet runoff, even stopping it if necessary? Well, it's a hypothetical, right? So again, right, we have to be always looking at whether there's orderly you know, markets and whether there's dysfunction in the markets. And I think we've shown, right, that when the markets are dysfunctional, as they were at the beginning of the pandemic, we take appropriate mm -hmm. actions. Right now, there are stresses in a lot of financial markets, right. especially abroad, right? You know, we're monitoring that very carefully. Uh -huh. And as we're raising rates, it's very appropriate that we should be monitoring sure. very carefully because we know that there could be fragilities in some of the markets. So, Is this a tool again, you could use, though? Slowing down the balance sheet runoff, could you see that being a tool? Well, there will be another, it depends on where the fragility, if it were to come, would be. So again, we don't want to presuppose where it's going to happen, but we need to be market? monitoring the treasury market? what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> right, in order to be able to assess what the appropriate action is. But right now, markets are functioning. Okay. Um, yeah, their spreads you did respond to some of the things happening in the UK, but again, they're, they're working, markets are working, mm -hmm. people are able to trade. Okay. Um, and so in that sense, we don't have a market functioning issue at the moment. Another question with balance sheet runoff is, you know, the, the aggressive rate hikes have hit the mortgage market. You could say effectively, you know, they've hit it hard. So uh, would this be an instance where maybe you would consider uh, to give a little more support to the mar mar mortgage market after it has been b borne a lot of the brunt of the monetary policy moves uh, and actually uh, slowing down the runoff in the, in the balance sheet of the mortgage-backed securities? Well, we set out our plan for the balance sheet, you know, well in advance of the plan, and we were letting the, the, the we're letting both run off up to an amount, right? Both the treasuries and the mortgages. Mortgages, of course, are longer term, so you know they are going to run off much more slowly than the treasuries will run off. I think we want to stick to that plan because the markets have understood the plan. They see it. They understand it. We did, you know, very well. I think broadcast what we were planning to do, then implemented it. So my my feeling is that's going to run, and then we're going to try to get our funds rate calibrated to make sure that inflation is right. on this downward path. So again, I don't see any need at the moment to adjust that plan. I think there's a lot of benefit to leaving that plan in place and okay. then allowing the funds rate, as we said, to be our main tool of policy. I want to look, look a little bit globally because the dollar is such a, an, it, such a factor right now in global markets. You said you're watching financial conditions in the dollar today, global developments for spillover back to the U.S. Now, the World Bank's warning that the strong dollar is a threat to other economies, especially vulnerable emerging market economies. So what does it take for other countries' problems 
to become spillovers to the U.S. that the Fed, the Fed policy has to address. Right. So again, when we're setting our policy, our lens is the dual mandate goals of maximum employment and price stability and the domestic for right. our economy. But we don't operate in a vacuum. We're part of a global economy. So of course, when we change our policy or when other countries change their policies, there can be effects on the US economy. Trade, the ch trade trend sure. was one. Certainly the dollar, right, affects our tr the terms of trade. And also financial market conditions. So, you know, we, our lens has got to be the domestic economy. But there, we have to realize that what happens abroad can affect the U.S. economy, and that's the lens through which we watch. But can it and does, it is, are two different things. We know it can, but right. you know, it, just in the World Economic Outlook, the IMF very concerned about the global economy, very concerned right. about aggressive central bank rate hikes, but we don't hear that from the Fed. You don't hear any of this concern, and I'm kind of wondering, uh, how can I ask this? I know you're concerned about the global economy, but at what point do you say you're concerned that you're watching it, that it's something that maybe you would have to adjust policy or consider in, when in taking um, decisions like 50 versus 75, pausing, etc.? I et think that I would frame it differently. I would say what happens abroad can affect the U.S. economy. And if we see, right, output, employment, inflation moving differently than what we thought thought was going to happen based on our policy, then we would maybe have to adjust our policy. But again, the lens is, right, what's the effect on right, progress on our goals, maximum employment, and price stability, so, and therefore, what's the appropriate policy given the outlook? So are you saying you'd have to see something so dramatic that, again, it's really rolling our bond markets, or somehow uh, there's some kind of upheaval in emerging markets that's creating some kind of sense of contagion? Is that the kind of thing where the Fed would finally have to look at it? No, I think we look at how the global policy. economy, and it does affect our policy in the sense that it affects our outlook for the U.S. economy. So, for example, right, growth abroad is slowing, right? What happens abroad can affect our economy through the trade channel and through financial market adjustments. So we have to be very attuned to that. But the lens is, okay, when that happens, what is the implications for the U.S. outlook? And that's the lens through which we, we, we re re react to those things. Separately, market dysfunction that we saw, for example, in the beginning of the pandemic, we addressed that. But that wasn't a monetary policy action. That was really about market functioning and really addressing okay. the dysfunction in markets. Well, before I let you go, I have to ask you the big question. Um, what went wrong at the Fed? I know you're all being asked this, and I'm, well, you know, inflation got way out of control. Uh, this is the last thing any of you wanted to happen or intended to ha happen. So what would you say went wrong? I think we thought that the supply chain issues would be resolved sooner than they were. And in fact, many of the firms we talked to expected the same thing. And I think that was uh, part of the issue. I think that um, because, you know, usually when you think of policy in the long and variable lags, when there's a supply shock, right, the appropriate thing to do is not to react to it. And so, remember, transitory inflation, that was a way of saying right. we really think this is supply side driven. It ended up being that demand also was being supported by the extraordinary levels of monetary policy accommodation and fiscal transfers. And that created uh -huh. a demand imbalance with that constrained supply. And I think that was something that we didn't see until later. But then we did do the pivot. Can, I, can you give me a really quick answer? If you could do it over, what's the thing you'd do differently? We would have raised interest rates sooner and probably we would have stopped buying bonds sooner.